Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. I'm very excited to have Hernando Planels, who is an assistant women's basketball coach at Duke University and was also the basketball choreographer for Coach Carter, the movie that we're going to break down today. So, Coach, uh, thanks for coming on the show. We're really excited to hear some insights to what was going on behind the scenes of this movie. I appreciate you having me. It was uh, it was my first movie I've ever worked on, and it's really actually dear to my heart because you know it's every time it's your first movie, your first project, you really have a, a big heart for it. So thanks for having me on. You got it. So you know what's it work? What's it like working with? Uh, were they actors? Were they basketball players? And how did that work as far as explaining you know fundamentals? Well, I, I think what we first did is that when you get the script, you want to make sure you have real basketball players. So it's really selling the director on that we needed real basketball players. Um, all the opponents' teams, we had tryouts all over the Los Angeles area. We had over 500 come out. They came out. I put them through drills. Um, and then we selected them based on how their skill level was on which team and how much camera time they have. Then we had to take the actors. And every actor always puts down his basketball as their hobby. So automatically casting directors think they could play basketball. So now it's, it was trying to embed those guys in. And for the most part, most of them were all – very good basketball players. Um, we actually had, though, uh, the guy who played um, battle was uh, Nana Bewonio, who actually played basketball at Kennedy High School and College of the Canyons in the L.A. area. So he was the only, quote-unquote, real basketball player who had to become an actor uh, for that movie. So we're going through some of this footage. Uh, the guy who plays Timo, uh, you couldn't do anything to help him with that form? No. <laughs> no, no. You, you, you almost do the best you can. Um, the interesting part about like those actors is that they treat sports like they're running their lines. So they could go and you could put them in front of basketball and they'll miss every shot for 30 minutes. Then all of a sudden when the director yells action, the cameras are rolling, they'll hit three in a row, boom, boom, boom. And then you're, you're like, wow, where did that come from? It helped me look good. So, so as long as that looked fine and they made shots, I was happy with it. Well, let's go through uh, a couple of plays that we were we selected here to go through. I thought it would get some in interesting insights on how you put this together. So at some point, about 27 minutes in, uh, you actually ran pinch post uh, with a strong side corner. And I'm a triangle offense guy, so I'm always excited to see kind of that kind of action happen. So uh, talk to me about that. Like, where were your inspirations for putting in these kind of structured plays? Well, I, I think the, the biggest thing is finding an offense that the players can run. So whether it's flex, whether it's triangle, we try to really put that in. The second part is making sure you could fill the camera frame. So really, triangle-type offense or even flex-type offense are great to fill the camera frame so you have constant moving um, behind it. Um, and I think it fits a storyline. I don't quite remember the script storyline on that, but basically a script would say, John takes a jump shot, so now I can go ahead and then kind of just tailor it for what it is. So I take a look at it. I used to run triangle offense when I was a high school coach. It was something I was familiar with. And then um, we had that nice little corner cut that made the feed and, and went from there. A little bit later on, I had some conceptual things coaching-wise that kind of were I was ripping my hair off. For instance, one of them was the other team was up three and they missed the free throw. And then they do a full court denial press. The only way you give up a tie, game tying three, which I believe is what happened. So when you did those kind of things, I mean, listen, I guess you see that happen in real life, right? So were you willing to sort of say, okay, maybe conceptually as a coach, we, you shouldn't do this fundamentally, but we needed to do that either. Did it happen in real life and you were mimicking that, or did you just need a dramatic situation for the, the movie? Well, I, I, I think the last part, the dramatic situation is the important part because, that, I mean, that's really what movie making is. I mean, they want every play to look amazing, fantastic, all that. Um, and, and so it's, it's trying to find that balance. When you're selling the director in the studio on, well, look, this is not really going to happen. And they're going to say, well, this is what we're going to, we want it to happen. How can we make it fit? So then you're trying to find that balance. So then, in, so then all of a sudden what we do is like, all right, well, look, maybe the coach is just this aggressive coach for the whole game they've been pressing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something they want to do. It's sort of their staple. So this is how we're going to justify it. So we're going to press it. This is how we're going to break the press and then run the play from that way. Because uh, trust me, there's been times where I look at the script and I said, there's no way we can get this done or no way this would happen. And the studio is saying it has to happen and they do write my paychecks. So we'll find a way to make it happen. Speaking of the studio, MTV produced this and it starts off problematic with a player double dribbling so he can alley-oop it to himself. And before the credits are through, we've got a shuffle of the feet for an uncalled travel. 
they do teach us a good lesson, which is never fake a backdoor cut. And here's a great example of how I teach the closeout with a stuttered jump stop. Love it. And this is the coach's son. You'd think he knows what's up, but he's wearing sweatpants? Come on. Uh, we have some nice flex action. It's, and unfortunately, the camera is, you know, tight. We can't quite see it. But um, again, you know, was it hard? Did you teach the flex in, in the whole method and then sort of let the cameras catch what they catch? Or was it very much like just the one or two cuts for the shot? Well, it's, we, we actually made the flex offense as our base motion offense. So in any type of the movie, when the director just wanted to capture basic movement, we'd go right into, into the flex. We thought it gave great screening action, great cuts, great movement. Plus, it was, it was easy for the actors to go in and learn it. I mean, actors are people who, unless they're actually taught how to freelance, they're not going to freelance on the court or off the court. So teaching that type of flex offense with the movement, with the cutting, with the screening, allowed them to understand it and actually get some good movement. We got some nice pinch post action with a strong side corner, and notice what happens when the defender helps one pass away. <laughs> Coach Carter is teaching them the shuffle cut, a high post back screen on the weak side, but his own son calls for the ball instead of setting the screen. Clearly the team is fractured and needs a Hollywood scene where they learn the value of standing up for each other and being a team. Thank goodness we've got Magic Mike to do some of Timo's push-ups, and the team is now ready to have an 80s-style montage of good plays. You said we're a team. One person struggles, and we all struggle. One player triumphs, we all triumph, right? Cue uplifting music. Call me when they're done. Coach Carter has them work on Hawk, a pick and roll on the right side with a double down screen on the left. And I nearly lost my coaching marbles out of sheer joy when I saw them running a version of the elevator play where two screeners closed the door on the cutter's defender for the open shot. And of course, this wouldn't be Hollywood without lighting cables and fake people in the stands. And here's an out-of-bounds play I might have to steal, where the inbounder sets a back screen at the elbow to get a dunk. Beautiful. And so, did the DP show up and sort of like you would just run a couple of plays uh, as a rehearsal and that allowed him to see where he wanted to set up the camera? So let's say in the script, I, I take a look at every single script that says something with basketball and then you basically tell him, look, we have 78 plays. By then they're just freaking out because that's way too many plays. So we try and cut it in half um, and then we have a playbook of what the shot clock or what the scoreboard will say, who the players are out there so it's easier. Um, during practices, we actually use a football mentality. We put all the plays on a big poster board, just raise it up. The players would know where they go, and then we'd run it. Well, let's talk about uh, a jump ball to start the game. And I noticed a, a really nice little play where you set a back screen on the jump ball uh, defender. Uh, it gets right in for a layup. Uh, you know, we don't see that often. You know, it only happens in, uh, in the high school level, at least, you know, in the beginning of the game. So, you know, where, where did that come about? Well, it was, it was really when I was a high school coach. I'd always, we would attempt to do it. It never would work, to be honest. It never worked when I was a high school coach. But in, in the movie, it was great setting. The script had it, jump ball, score right away. It doesn't say how they scored, but in order to shorten the plays in Coach Carter, we decided to put plays together. So instead of having a tip and then setting up into a half-court offense, having a tip rolling right into the score off, off the tip in the back screen kind of work together and the director loved it because then they're just shooting everything all at the same time. You get this great action, the crowd gets hyped and everything else and, and it worked. Yeah, it was a nice crane shot. It was actually subtle. You know, if you're not watching for it, you don't see the back screen so much where maybe another director would have been like, let's really focus and get that screen and then it kind of loses your flow, which I thought really worked where we let the play play out in one shot. Yeah, it was great. He, he allowed us to let the play develop. So there are a couple times we were able to get some pickup shots without even knowing what was going to happen, and, and it worked out great. Later on in the big game, we get a really nice block of a dunk, totally clean, but look at all this trash talking, taunting, and a near fight. Yet no one called a technical foul. 
Most of the crowd is into it, except someone forgot to tell this extra to cheer up or do something, but the director must have made up for it by telling this guy to go absolutely nuts with the sprinkler. With their season on the line down one, they run motion and get their spacing a little bit off. Their star junior battle gets a pin down screen to get open, but their guard has drifted to the wing and his man should easily steal this ball. However, it magically gets to him so he can shoot a running one-handed hook? Did this just become a period sports film from the 50s? To make matters worse, the only way they lose this game is if they full court press and pull their defense way out of position. To his credit, Coach Carter is yelling at them to get back, but at this point in their season, the players themselves should know better. Of course, it opens up a long down court pass to Livewire, who calmly rises up and nails the game winner. So how did that happen? Did you argue for that? Was that the real way that happened and you had to stick to the real, you know, the, the real facts? What what happened in that play? Well, I mean, it, 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 again, it was one of those things where you're like, it's, it's, it, if you're, a, like you said, a good discipline team, it's not going to really happen. So the only way to justify it was tweaking it this way. Yes, they practice all year. Yes, they are disciplined. Yes, they follow what Coach Carter wants them to do. But they're also 16 and 17 year old athletes, mm -hmm. which means if they haven't been in that situation before, which they haven't, and they've had all the stress with all the grades and just trying to play and the neighborhood and everything else, then all it's it's a lack of judgment. Coach Carter was telling them to get back. They got overzealous, got crazy, went into full on press, and the long pass went. And and really, if I could justify it in my mind, then justify it into the players and the actors' minds. They'll execute it, even though the refs, I think other coaches, I think the, even some of the players like, Coach, I, this wouldn't happen. My like, guys, I know, but let's go with it and let's let's make it the best we can possibly do. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, it does happen. I see it all the time, especially in the city uh, when I'm watching other games and I'm just scratching my head. The only way you're going to put your team in a position to lose is to do that. But it happens. Um, did that happen in the real life? Were you trying to pattern that or was that just a completely fabricated for the movie? Yeah, there, there was very little footage that we were able to see from the actual real Richmond High School team. Um, what I really requested when I first got the job was to actually see if there was any old Richmond tape to actually see some of the plays that they did. We couldn't find any, so then we had to go ahead and basically take the script, uh, you know, work with the, with the script writer on some things that may or may not happen um, based on the storyline, based on the point of time, based on how we're actually going to fit it. Um, and then we kind of came up with the best formula to basically appease both sides you know real basketball people but also you know the directors the studio and everything else so did, but did that happen did they get all the way to like the finals and then lose the buzzer in real life no no i know I'm, I'm i'm if i remember the story correctly i think they made it into the the semifinals. um but it was just such a miraculous run i mean really um i think coach Carr, the movie made it into a whole lot basketball. I mean, usually there are two type of movies I work on. There are movies with basketball in it, and then there are basketball movies, um, period. And this one was they really wanted to focus on the basketball, so it was the whole buildup in order for them to go all the way to that kind of state championship. Uh, terrific information, really great insight into how these things work. I'm sure everyone has been fascinated to hear your take on how you actually put these things together when you're shooting a movie with basketball in it. And I know that uh, gr it'll be great to have your commentary and, and, and infused into what we're going through from the X's and O's standpoint. So, Coach, uh, thanks for coming on here and joining us and giving us your insight. No, it's, it's my pleasure. It, it, you know, Working on production has been a huge blessing in my life and just being able to share how it's done and, and, and how it helped in my mainstream coaching world has, has just been has just been great. So anytime you need me on, I'd love to do it. It's it's great talking about, you know, my, my the dearest movie to my heart of all of them that I've worked on. You got it. And don't forget, sports fans, at B Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You in? Are you in, coach? Absolutely. Ah!